The documentary genre has always held a tentative role in the history of cinema. Many canonical lists may only feature a handful of inclusions. I've always felt that this has to do with the idea that to create a documentary, one has such lesser control of the outcome than if one were to make a narrative film. Documentary has to take spontaneity, fortune. To create a great documentary, one has to embrace the unknown. As for what makes a good documentary, this may be an even more contentious discussion. A filmmaker can merely discover a perfect story, one that unfolds its greatness before them without them having to do much. There is the fact that a great documentary can simply be an enthralling story. But what about those masterfully created stories with whom we do not share the same end result? Superb storytelling from a perspective that we disagree with. Although it may not seem like it, these elements are at play even in traditional filmmaking. But there's something about dealing with real life that makes the documentary genre so impactful when it's done right. Sometimes it's about capturing lightning in a bottle. For others, it's about harnessing the storytelling dexterity of a creative mind. However, at its zenith sits the fusion of both, wherein art doesn't reflect life, but rather respects it. This is a collection of those greatest moments in cinema, where for a brief moment, art and life sit in awe of one another's capacity. Stories like these emerge every day, all around us, but for the time being, these are my considerations for the greatest documentaries of all time. Number 15. Titicut Follies Insanity, a subject which to this day evokes trepidation in its utterance, as though the word is a threat to the very dehumanisation of a person whose existence is a dilemma with which we do not know how to deal. There is understandably a sensitivity to the subject, as when one person becomes afflicted with any kind of mental illness, everyone in contact with them becomes a victim. It's a saddening state of affairs to which we have no answer. And as there is no answer, perhaps the best exploration within art is to offer none. This is the case for Frederick Wiseman's Titicate Follies and its observations at Bridgewater State Hospital, a center for the criminally insane. I want all those men arrested. Vinegar, immediately, for vinegar, from 168 pounds, now down to 96 it's a pound. Abenigi, and all those known. Vinegar, the deputy Fleur, and all those known, John F. Power, Vinigi, Volpe. Titicate Follies offers a sense of humanity in one of the most dehumanizing places that human beings inhabit. Following the patients, we examine people who are trapped in a building, trapped in an institution, and trapped within their own minds, with neither appearing to offer any kind of escape. Filmed in close proximities on black and white film, with no intrusion on the part of the filmmakers, there's no room to detract from the suffering on screen, as though traditional filmmaking has no place here, where all sense of life has been sucked away. Paranoia and anxiety have made a home within the walls, to the point that the inmates and professionals become indistinguishable through their actions. It's difficult that in this documentary, by merely acting as a fly on the wall, what unfolds before us is the closest idea of truth in cinema. It's neither expose nor opinion piece, as what is presented is reality. Whether the person is a patient, participator, or even viewer, there's an undeniable sense of rage that emerges from Titicate Follies. What would you say? I stood on my right clean! Oh, Jim. Tonight! What? Tonight! What would you say? Can't hear you, Jim. What are you hiding, Jim? Right. We're subjected to agonizing screams of inmates, not even fully comprehensive of the suffering that they endure, though cognizant to feel it just enough. And often those same inmates have moments of clarity, and perhaps some of their mania lies in exposing the truth we're seeing about the world around them. 
a world that is schizophrenic in itself. Vietnam, over the American execution of these natives of Vietnam. They're not Viet Cong, they're not communists. Anyone that the American government doesn't like, they use the, the first on this term of communist. Because I, I speak the way I do, you're going to call me a communist? I'm not a communist, even though I have communist affiliations. Syndicate Follies was heavily censored upon its release, invoking ideas of censorship on the grounds of obscenity. Perhaps images like these shouldn't be exposed to the public, Everything that occurs in these spaces is a private matter and is too complicated to be discussed through the lens of cinema or any art form for that matter. There are ethical questions raised by the documentary, undeniably. However, when to be simply presented with the lives that are led by those among us who suffer the most, when the very question of sanity and how to declare someone as sane becomes blurred, when we have to ask severe questions of the authority figures in places such as these, after those matters are solved, then perhaps can we address the ethical quandary of showing it. The topic is complex and uncomfortable, and the documentary has no issue with showing it, as Titicate Follies remains an excruciating glimpse into a hellscape that still exists on our doorstep. No, no, no. I, I don't want to stay here. If, I am a prisoner. If you say, I am not one to take the medication, we agree. You're not That's, not the, you take That's not the principle, That's not the principle. The principle is that I am here, obviously well and, uh, and healthy, and I am getting ruined. Number 14. Symbiopsychotaxiplasm. In 1968, multiple documentaries were made at once that all happened to share the same name. One is a meta documentary about the nature of documentary, the other is a documentary filming that documentary. And the other is a documentary that's shooting the documentary about the original documentary. Also, there was a non-existent fictional film at the same time all of this was going on. In the end, it all became one project and went by the simple name, Symbiopsychotaxoplasm. Incidentally, this afternoon, uh, after lunch, we have the, the camp version of this picture starring you and Jonathan in the leading roles. Camp version? Right. I thought that's what I was doing now. <laughs> Um, <laughs> what the purpose of this documentary is, is essentially down to viewer interpretation. It's a complete dismantling of the idea of documentary, and perhaps on a deeper level of film's ability to document truth, displaying the infinite subjectivities that the medium offers. But on the other hand, it's also just a cinematic joke. Here is an open-ended film, with no plot, that we can see, with no end that we can see, and an action that we can't follow. We're all intelligent people. The obvious thing is to fill in the blanks, to create for each of our own selves a, a film that we understand. Director William Greaves gave direction to various crews with differing responsibilities for his new film. The only thing was that each crew didn't know what film was being made. Meanwhile, Greaves adopted this persona of a buffoon of a filmmaker who's making an obscure film that apparently is all about the sexual element, of which there is none. Look, for the last time, will you please tell me what is bugging you? No, you tell me what is, or better yet, who is bugging you. But the best part is, is that no one but the director is in on the joke. One of the great things about this film is that it's so difficult to replicate again. In a time wherein people are so aware of cameras and their innate ability to manipulate, people are capable of reading images far more comprehensively and also understand the unspoken agreement that all people are performative in front of a camera. However, these sentiments appear strangely absent from this film, as everyone here is a professional in their field and approaches the project with a deep sincerity. What ends up happening is that the crews inadvertently end up making an entirely new documentary on their own based on Greaves' ineptitude. For all anybody knows, you know, Bill is standing right outside the door and he's directing this whole scene, all right? It could be. Nobody knows. Maybe we're all acting, all right? Maybe we're all acting, you know? I mean, I'm acting, you know? And that's it. I mean, I was, I was, Bill, Bill could have stood, stood outside of the door and told me, now, now, Rosen, when you get in there, you, uh, 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 tell them about this, you know, when you get to a certain point. Nobody out there knows whether or not we're for real. 
all he had to do was add a level of uncertainty and people strive to find any meaning they possibly can. The resulting documentary is a mash of perspectives that juxtapose and contradict one another, exploring the use of split screens so that we can see the broader image of just how ridiculous the project has gotten. As viewers, we get immediately that there is no purpose, and yet as people clamour to find something tactile within what they're doing, they unknowingly end up making it more complicated. Throughout this list, most documentaries are lauded for their impact, and in some instances how they were able to instigate legitimate change in people's lives. However, Symbiopsychotaxiplasm isn't that, but it's not trying to be. It brings to light many of the obnoxious tropes of artistic experimentation, but ultimately, it's a joke. It's one single joke for the duration of its running time, and it never gets old. Sure, fine. Thanks a lot. What kind of move picture you make? What kind? Um, well, it's a feature. It's a feature length. Huh? Uh, it's a feature length. Uh, we Watch don't know. <laughs> you don't know. It's, it's a feature length. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. We'll find out after we develop. Uh, the tentative. The tentative title of it is Over the Cliff. Over the cliff. We gotta find the cliff now. Huh? <laughs> We've got it. This is this is the cliff. This is the cliff. This is the cliff. <laughs> Number thirteen, the five obstructions. There are films about the making of films, and there are films about the nature of film itself. The Five Obstructions is a collaboration between Lars von Trier and his mentor Jürgen Leth. The premise of the film is simple. Lars von Trier imposes a challenge to Leth, that he must remake his 1968 short film The Perfect Human. However, in the vein of von Trier's penchant for disrupting cinematic language, he must remake the movie five times with five different stipulations. Yeah, but it was a whole full stage of failure, like with the bean spinner. Yeah, it was a gave with the twelve frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The first stipulation is that the film must be shot in Cuba. There must be no set. No shot can last longer than twelve frames, and he must answer all of the questions he posed in the original film. Også i dag oplevede jeg noget, som jeg håber kunne forstå om nogle dage. The obstructions continue from there, and as we see the final result of these remakes, we're also shown the perspective of the artist in the constant search for reason behind their creations. The film is an endless experiment as to whether one can find a deeper purpose in a film via dissecting it. Well, inevitably through this, other questions are raised. Is the constant experimentation of art a diminutive factor towards art itself? By constantly renewing what we've already established, are we diluting the original message? Nu bruger vi den til ligesom at dykke ned og dykke tilbage og se hvor hvor vi kan kan støde lidt til dig og undersøge den i virkeligheden, ikke? The documentary is an experiment in and of itself that ends up creating other art pieces within the art piece. But what the purpose of the documentary is, is by its nature, a confusing one. Von Trier and Leth accept from the very beginning that the original film is undoubtedly the best, and all they seem to be doing is putting one another through a pointless torment to essentially debase a piece of art that they're both fond of. It ultimately adds to Von Trier's oeuvre as well as his reputation as a provocateur, a persona non grata at Cannes, creating cinema which seems to offend anyone and everyone, this penchant for doing what shouldn't be done is the foundational principle of this work of non-fiction. Du laver en meget, 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 meget simpel regel for den her film. Ja. Og jeg kan ikke forestille mig andet, at det bliver noget lort. Nej. Og skal vi ikke sige, at det er godt nok, hvis det er det? det jeg ville være meget glad, hvis det var noget lort, ikke? Men der er kun én eneste kondition med denne her nye film, ikke? Og det er, at det skal være en tegnefilm. Out of all of his work, however, The Five Obstructions displays a more understandable von Trier, as there's a maturity in acknowledging his own villainy as a filmmaker. He's known for the torture of his protagonists behind the camera, and here is no exception, but we see it as a role he adopts to explore the fringes of the medium rather than the fetishistic lens of a tyrant. In doing so, 
he can explore the very nature of creativity when varying circumstances are imposed onto you. And in the five obstructions, we see how in all forms of creation, you learn more about yourself and one's art when you strip away the excess, take away rather than add on to, return inwards rather than expand outwards. Von Trier is the evil mastermind behind this project, but it is a sincere attempt at discovering the secrets within the medium itself. Over-analysis of one's own work and the work of others makes all decisions superfluous, and perhaps meaning is divulged along the way, only understood after the fact. If there is anything to take away from this film, it's that in our search for meaning, art walks a fine balance between instinct and intellectualization. And when you lean too far in either direction, you may end up in a land with no meaning at all. I min egen filmiske opdragelse, der har netop det som Jørgen jo så smukt kalder spillereglerne altid været meget, meget vigtige. Det er noget, som han har indført i mit univers. Og disse spilleregler er altså nogle begrænsninger eller en selvtugt, om du vil. Og den, denne tugt vil jeg så gerne påføre Jørgen. Nummer 12 the thin blue line. The modern documentary landscape has been defined first and foremost as the era of the true crime genre. What is by its nature gripping and macabre tales of real life horrors have also found themselves to be such a bankable product that they've fallen into cliche. The over the top mystery that's not as hidden as the filmmakers would lead you to believe. The unfurling of the thriller to a punchy ambient infused soundtrack bring a semi-unknown story to the mix, and you have a recipe for a trendy topic for everyone to binge and discuss over the next week or so. But the true crime genre wasn't always this, and it can still be one of the most engrossing genres of documentary. But the reason that it exists today, in its format, is all because of one film. Arguably the most influential documentary on this list, The Thin Blue Line. Got out of the car and walked up, and before he got to the window where the driver was, he was in the right position. This man just turned around and just pop, pop, pop with a little small caliber pistol. Following the closed murder case of a Dallas police officer, The Thin Blue Line was the first film to popularize the idea of crime reconstruction for a documentary. Rather than simply having talking head interviews, the information provided by them was filmed cinematically. This gives the film one of its most impressive commentaries. When dealing with testimonies, we're reliant on memory of our subjective perception of incidents. The Thin Blue Line plays with this and can use the same piece of footage to deliver various pieces of new information that aren't new at all. They were in front of us the whole time. it comes out that we weren't looking for a blue baker, we were looking for a comet. And no telling the man hours, we literally wasted looking for a blue baker. The Thin Blue Line breaks beyond the ideas of what we now see as a true crime documentary. When you watch the film, it's so evident its level of influence on the genre. And yet one must remember that this approach was so novel. But what it's known even more for is the level of investigative journalism that this documentary also has. The subject matter of the film was a case that was over a decade old at the time. But the film argues the premise that the person who was charged didn't commit the crime. In fact, they couldn't have done it. The film was so compelling in its argumentation that without revealing the end, required an actual re-examination of the evidence presented at the trial. My younger brother was born, it was kind of like he was daddy's favorite, you know, or something, I don't know. Everybody's life's going to take some kind of path, regardless of what happens, you know. Uh, and uh, I think maybe a lot of the things I did when I was younger was an attempt to get back at him or something, you know, for the way he treated me. 
for all its originality, the documentary made the most impact outside of its artistic relevance. With music by Philip Glass and a slowly opening curtain revealing all of the secrets of its case, director Errol Morris with this film unknowingly created a documentary that reshifted the entire genre through a simple innovation which is now synonymous with the medium. And with many pale imitators, it's still difficult to top the original. And I asked him to please put it up. And I think he handed me the pistol and I put it under the driver's seat. He wanted to go to the movies, so we went to the movies. We got there probably about seven o'clock. Ironic that at the time, the very idea of reenacting the real life sequences was seen as antithetical to the notion of documentary. And for that reason, it was disqualified from Academy Award nominations. The story itself is a fascinating one. However, it's in the unique storytelling that the Thin Blue Line is such a relevant part of film history. This is what a documentary looks like when it's filmed by a great creative of the medium. Someone who's not only concerned with conveying information, but harnessing the artistry of filmmaking. This is when reality and cinema coalesce, and the result did not only change the terrain of film, but more importantly, even if in some small way, was able to change the real world. Got witnesses who can identify you. Got witnesses who can identify your truck. I said, you're caught. Now, you're caught to tell the truth. David said, well, okay, I killed him. Number 11. Cabra Macado para Mojé. What began as a film retelling the assassination of Brazilian peasant union leader, João Pedro, was primed to portray a profile of the country's tumultuous era of corruption that was rife during the 1960s. The film had members of the region acting as themselves and as one another, introducing their lives and their ensuing struggle to organize the agricultural workers for a fair share of what they considered was exploitation. The footage on screen is of that film. The only issue is that the film was never finished. Shortly into filming, the military dictatorship got word of the production and arrested a large amount of the crew. Materials were confiscated and equipment was seized. 20 years later, director Eduardo Cochino returned to the region to finish the film, but instead made it into a documentary. He would interview the people that remained in the region and find out what happened between then and now learn how things have changed and how many of them have stayed the same. What was once a film about the ongoing battle for workers' rights after an assassination was now something completely different. The story was over and now the documentary simply finds out what happened. Brás, conhecido pelos vizinhos como João, fugiu de Galileia em 64 e mudou de nome para evitar perseguições. Desiludido com a atividade política, Brás não gosta mais de Galileia, nem de lembrar as lutas do passado. The region of Paraíba in which the documentary takes place is a simple land which houses the residents and characters of the film. However, upon returning after so much time, we learn that many of them have left, many of them have died, and some of them disappeared with no knowledge of what happened to them. The one person central to this conflict is Elizabeth Teixeira the widow of the assassinated João Pedro, who no one from the town had seen for 20 years. Until we discover her life now, how she still inhabits the spirit of radical change that her husband fought for, and we're told a story of history from the vantage point of those who lost. <laughs> It's an amazing feat to consider a project by all logistical standards dead, only to return to it so many years later. The main aspect of the documentary and the most heartfelt element is that as some of the footage survived, it's shown to the villagers and they recognize people and characters from all those years ago. <laughs> 
Não, 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 but are told all of the stories as if they are through some passing legend. The stories told by the people are of such strong importance and it's as if the remnants of those events still linger amongst them. Só Satanás, eu acho que eu não, eu não acredito que estou vivo não, porque eu nunca vi um espírito da minha qualidade aguentar. With such an ellipse in its story, it's fascinating to be part of the story firsthand, only to have the unknown elements filled in by the testimony of those who are there. We have only the stories to fill in the gaps of this person from a young age to someone much older, having experienced so much hardship in life. Though when these stories are told, and much of it is made up of the past, of what was missed. What is still spoken most of are the dreams of the future, fighting for what may be, never giving up the struggle. Ultimately, if it wasn't for this film being finished, then these people may have been forgotten, which was the whole point, that there are people who are treated less than such because they're out of sight and out of mind. But what Cabra Macado para Mujer does is give a voice to the voiceless and show how the past becomes a different world entirely, yet one that we will always be connected to. Mas eu quero que o filme resiste esse nosso repúdio a quaisquer sistemas de governo. Estará registrado, te garanto. Nenhum presta para o pobre. Nenhum. Number 10. The Killing of America. The Mondo films of the 60s and 70s were notorious for establishing a genre of film in a new boundary-pushing era where the rise of television had brought footage of war and terror into our living rooms. A global population was becoming more desensitized to the horrors of mankind and the era of the shockumentary sought to supplement that. Films such as Faces of Death present real footage of real-life carnage. Many of the scenes, however, were faked because the main purpose of these kinds of works was to unsettle the viewer. However, the documentary The Killing of America too found itself nestled within this category of exploitative films. However, rather than mere shock value, The Killing of America approaches its subject matter with a sincere exploration of a simple question. How and why did our societies become so violent? I would have killed until they gunned me down. I wouldn't have been able to reason my way out of it. I was scared to death and I was violent. I felt my back hit that wall. I was the rabbit that always ran, that always backed away, always burned his bridges. And suddenly there weren't any more. And I, my back hit that wall and I came out screaming and kicking and shooting. Directed by Leonard Schrader, the brother of Paul Schrader, The Killing of America possesses that same familial intrigue into the fringes of society and how their shadows are slowly becoming integrated into the world at large. The documentary essentially tells the story of a 20-year period in the United States, bookmarked by two murders, the assassination of John Kennedy and the killing of John Lennon. Within that two-decade period, it chronicles the rise of serial killers, mass shooters and random acts of violence throughout the nation, and it displays the impact of this by showing us accompanying and horrifying footage. Can we get some help from you? We have friends. You cannot get any help from me. They are going to take me. They're going to put me in prison. They're going to put me in there. They're going to put people there where, where they rape you. They, they turn this thing off so you don't get these four letter words. The documentary is most notorious for this footage. Much of it is of a rather extreme nature. There will be an inevitable criticism of the film in that it uses a collection of footage to criticize the thing that people will say it inevitably becomes an obsession with violence. However, examining the documentary as a whole, you're left with the patterns of violence, the psychological profiles and suggestions as to where these obsessions may lie. In essence, the film doesn't glorify anything on screen, but rather paints a chilling perspective of our world, 
recognizing that this has become a part of it and is growing by the day. Lawrence Bittaker, with an IQ of 138, dragged high school girls into his van, then murdered them by twisting a coat hanger around their throat with a pair of pliers. When his tape recording of one murder was played in court, people rushed outside and vomited. The voiceover by Chuck Riley is one of the great performances of a narrator, and it certainly cements the terror of the footage if it weren't horrifying enough. The Killing of America certainly is a radical film, and even proposes a radical, some may say fatalist perspective for a documentary. But much like in Titicut Follies, perhaps the rage we feel at watching works such as these lies not in the work themselves, but in the complex systems that permit them to exist. The Killing of America's goal clearly is not to titillate, and perhaps it doesn't offer answers, though it is a vital perspective to show, even if what it suggests is something dreadful. The Killing of America is, in terms of content, the most shocking documentary you may see. Most films simply won't feature this kind of intense imagery, because most also don't require it. But this is a film that benefits from its unabashed use of the extreme, for it's an extreme message that it attempts to convey. The modern history of the United States is being written through violence, and it doesn't appear to be stopping. Two people were shot at this Central Park vigil. While you watched this movie, five more of us were murdered. One was the random killing of a stranger. Number 9. Grizzly Man Werner Herzog's obsession in documentary appears to be the violence of the human condition. In Grizzly Man, we live at the boundary of man and nature, and the never-ending battleground that takes place on this strange terrain. Many documentaries find a character of unparalleled proportions, and the film can be spurred on alone by such a person. Grizzly Man is one of those documentaries, and its main character is Timothy Treadwell. Love you, Rowdy. Give it to me, baby. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. The film is made up primarily of the vast collection of archive footage of Timothy Treadwell, a man who spent over a decade living in the wild amongst grizzly bears in Alaska, until one autumn afternoon when he was inevitably killed at the hands of the creatures he loved so much. On its surface, the story is one of a crackpot who should have expected what he deserved, but through the lens of Werner Herzog, the story is reframed in a far deeper and much more beautiful way. In his diaries, Treadwell speaks often of the human world as something foreign. He made a clear distinction between the bears and the people's world, which moved further and further into the distance. Timothy Treadwell is the story, and he's someone whom we know so much, have so much footage of, and yet there's an enigma about him. In many ways, he conquered nature. He was able to traverse this landscape which Herzog shows as transcendent in its beauty, all the while ferociously violent. Treadwell is the only kind of person who could and would put himself in this kind of world, treading the thin line between purity and naivety. It's okay. I love you. 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 I'm sorry. The subject matter is fascinating, and it's helped by the simple fact that Treadwell documented so much of himself and his absurdly dangerous venture. But Herzog adds so much more. He attempts to understand the story of Treadwell in a way only Herzog seems to be able to. He treats his subject without any prejudice and is neither critical nor admiring of Treadwell. Rather, he finds a myriad of ways to untangle the mystery he finds within him. And what haunts me is that in all the faces of all the bears that Treadwell ever filmed, I discover no kinship, no understanding, no mercy. I see only the overwhelming indifference of nature. In many ways, Treadwell is deeply human, upset by superficial problems of being a failed actor, of having a previous drug problem, and escaping from the world in an extreme case of disassociation. On the other hand, he's a person of great virtue. 
one who truly cares and loves the great world around him. Someone who has an innate ability and understanding of all that's unseen. Herzog uses interviews with friends, psychologists, ecologists to try to put together the story of Timothy Treadwell. All the while he maintains this voice of God persona, narrating the metaphysical lens of what occurs. We begin knowing that it's these decisions that ultimately got Timothy Treadwell killed, and yet we can't help but leave with sympathy, and even perhaps some envy of his life, that he rejected the modern world in the way that he knew how, and lived by the ethos that he truly wanted to. Herzog captures the symbolic world that we all live in, that the landscapes we inhabit reflect our inner world, and that Treadwell left an imprint on that, which won't be shaken away, as though he carved something deep within the Earth's crust, a violent and dangerous landscape that possesses all of the beauty we find so alluring. The bears which Treadwell loved so much possessed all of those same qualities, battles to the death against one another, camaraderie, play, all of the qualities Treadwell understood and reflected to them. Herzog made Grizzly Man, and in the hands of anyone else, it could have been a farce, yet Herzog crafted something truly human in a work that exists outside the human world. I've tried hard. I bleed for them, I live for them, I die for them. I love them, I love this. It's tough work. But it's the only work I know and it's the only work I'll ever, I'll ever want. Number eight, Tai Siku, West of the Tracks. In the past century, the world has grown at an exponential rate, and what is deemed old world and ancient history encroaches closer and closer to the present moment. And as we endlessly leap towards the future, our immediate past is left in the shadows to be forgotten. This is the story of Tai Shi Ku, West of the Tracks, the story of the Tai Shi district of China known for its metal factories. What was once a region that at the height of China's economic boom was a staple of the country is now slowly degenerating into a derelict relic of the past. The landscape is harsh, where icy winters merge with the searing hot blast furnace from the factories, where the air is filled with sulfur and smog and all civilization seems miles away. But for many, this is home, it's all they have. And as times continue to change, the factories begin to close and soon, the people may have even less than this. Director Wang Bing is known for his unflinching examination of China, its history and its people. But nowhere does he capture its desire for industrialization and its seemingly infinite capacity to mistreat its citizens more than in West of the Tracks. Filmed over many years, the documentary is split into three chapters, Rust, Remnants and Rails, with each chapter focusing on a different aspect of the region and its relation to the metal industry. The first section follows the workers of the factory, the second deals with the families and their housing, and the final chapter on a father and son who scavenge raw material from rail yards to sell to the factory. However, the inevitable end to all their stories, as the ever-growing idea of displacement, unemployment and an uncertain future crawls closer. Wang Bing's observational style of filmmaking stops us from watching worlds at a distance and instead makes us watch a world that's right beside us. He remains silent, barely even a presence at all. Cameras will sit still in rooms, shot on video, they linger and let the natural interactions of people occur. Oh, 
那个干啥去了？后来那很难改。昨天晚上没打啊？啊？昨天晚上。三毛钱的手雷呢？昨天逛购物了吧？昨天没打。是啊。The conditions we see in Taishiku are harsh. There appears to be danger in every corner, as people here seem to have no idea of safety or preservation. But ultimately, this is their lens of life. This is just normal for them. And it's here that Wang Bing excels in telling the story of these people, because where it could simply be a film about the hardship and turmoil of these people's lives, there's always space for compassion. It's there in every shot. Taishiku is a constant reminder that the genre of documentary is capable of so much. It exposes people to a world they never even knew existed. It gives places forgotten by time a renewed vitality, and it teaches us about the humanity that exists in our fellow man. That as long as there are people in a place, there's always the soul of mankind that accompanies it. What society? 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 Number 7. Hoop Dreams They say that life imitates art. To those people, I would say watch Hoop Dreams and you may not be so sure. Cinema has given us biopics of athletes and those great stars whose image has been already curated in the cultural zeitgeist. But what of those stories of those people who are on the journey to become those mythical icons? What are the stories of those people who want to become great? In the final minutes of a close game, Arthur takes it strong to the hoop. He's called for charging and fouls out of the game. Hoop dreams follow two young boys, William and Arthur from Chicago. Over the course of five years, as they grow and pursue their dreams of making it into the NBA. What occurs is a story that plays like fiction. All of the personal family drama, the immense lows, the exalting highs that come with playing competitive sports feel as though they're taken from a Hollywood script. You think you're better than you are. The two big guys are prima donnas. They should be killing people. For you people that are really agonizing, and you know, just hate all this stuff and all the hollering. If you don't make a turn, it'll be over next week. So you won't have to worry about it. That's the point. It's astounding that this film is in fact a documentary because watching it truly feels like a tightly written drama. Even as we reach the climax of the film, it winds its tension into a crescendo because sometimes art imitates life. In Hoop Dreams, though it plays as a story for us, it appears that there's no other alternative for these boys. This is their life, and they do everything in their power to achieve a singular, finite goal. However, this isn't the movies. A sequence in which one of the boys injures his knee and requires months of rehabilitation completely alters the trajectory of the film. And it's at these dramatic divergences that you have to jolt yourself to remember that this isn't just the film, this is their lives. And as the boys grow older and the stakes grow higher, you begin to realize the finality of some of their encroaching decisions. All of a sudden you consider, what if they don't make it? Arthur Agee, spinning inside, tough shot goal. Arthur has a great first half, but the Rams play even better. Hoop Dreams is a story of many things. It's a story of ambitious young men and the dedication that's required to achieve your ambitions. But what must be accounted for are the often incalculable chance occurrences that can either halt our paths or propel us forward. Your story many times is going to be at ends with someone else's. And this is one of the major elements of the drama at play here. The two subjects of the documentary end up on diverging paths towards the same goal. There's a lingering inevitability that one will succeed 
at the expense of the other. In order to play at Marquette, you're going to have to get the 18. And they're very, very concerned. One assistant called twice this week, and Bo Ellis called today. Smile, William. It's not the end of the world, right? Hoop Dreams excels in showing us that within life, there are an infinite number of these stories with winners and losers, dreams unfulfilled, and sometimes stories that don't reach their conclusion until they've spanned across generations. Regardless of what happens, beneath all of our endeavours, both achieved and forgotten, there's a human being and there's a story. One that touches so many others without even realising it. It's a story about basketball, but at its core, it's a universal story about the depth of humanity and all of the people within it searching for more. He wasn't used to the discipline and the control. He reverted back to maybe his environment, where he came from. I've just never been around a lot of white people, and uh, it was different because at a black school, you know, I could associate with the people that was, you know, you know, they talk the way I talk. It's a little hard, but I, I can adjust to it. Number six. As I was moving ahead, occasionally I saw brief glimpses of beauty. We look at documentaries as a form that documents reality. And so, what are the ways that one can document reality? Every time we record a piece of footage with any kind of recording device, aren't we in essence making a documentary? Well, if you have the poetic sensibility of Jonas Mekesh, then the answer is a resounding yes. Because by taking a lifetime of home movies and narrating over them, Mekesh delivers to us, as I was moving ahead, Occasionally, I saw brief glimpses of beauty, a documentary which transforms the very act of living into a piece of art. I go through this life with my Bolex, and I have to film what I see, what is happening right there. What an ecstasy just to film why do I have to make films when I can just film, when I can just film whatever is happening there in front of me? A story of family, of friends, of memory, of experience. Mekesh in this documentary beautifies the entire human experience. A collection of Super 8 footage is strewn before us, sometimes even as he speaks in a stream of consciousness, unrelated to the images before our eyes. His reflections are bolstered by the imagery, whose very medium denotes an overwhelming sense of nostalgia, even for places that we've never experienced. The use of the smaller film format has always filled us with a sense of memory, like looking at a sepia photograph. There's an innate warmth to the images that other formats struggle to replicate. The shots feel personal, like a shared secret between the audience and the filmmaker. He's revealing his absolute truth unfiltered. In the spring. And when the summers come, I am ecstatic. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay here. Beyond that, the rest of the film is left to experience. There is no story, no narrative arc. It's just a man in the twilight of his years reflecting on the life he's lived. And in the exploration of such a life, only chooses the beauty. The world here crafted by Mekesh is a world with no hardship, no sadness. Everything is beautiful. And when you watch a man's life flashing before your eyes and the truth that emerges from his very soul, it too is difficult to see anything else. And by themselves as they pass through as they go and they go very very innocent number five OJ, Made in America. 
Sports have a deep rooted cultural impact. Teams are representatives of regional tribalism. Athletes are icons of our ambition and capacity as a species. And OJ Simpson was an originator of those kind of icons. Now the story of OJ was at one point a fascinating look at the first modern athlete, breaking boundaries of race, class, and the potential for what a sports personality represents. However, upon becoming the prime suspect in the largest public interest murder case in US history, the story of OJ Simpson became something so much more. More so than the murder itself, he became the story of race relations in the United States, the obsession with celebrity culture, the privileges of wealth. The story of OJ could only have been, as the title of the documentary states, Made in America. The game plan is uh, really being conducted by Mr. Simpson at this point, and it's very much like when the president travels down a major thoroughfare like a freeway. The documentary is more often viewed episodically nowadays. However, at its premiere, it was screened in its eight-hour entirety, winning the Academy Award for Documentary Feature. The film is one long piece, and it demonstrates this in the continuous tapestry that it weaves regarding O.J. Simpson, the man, telling his life chronologically and attempting to decipher in this world of professional athletics, broken family homes, and high celebrity status, what exactly the man represents and why were so many infatuated by him? Your tears only registered your pride, and it's a very great pride, and you should enjoy it, because this is a very great young man. O.J., the congratulations of all of us to you for a truly remarkable season, and more importantly, for your impeccable character. Thank you, Mr. Cassell. It appears that no matter who is speaking about O.J. in the documentary, they approach him from a different angle, as though O.J. Simpson was this chameleon-like figure that wormed his way into every layer of American society and adopted a new persona, a narrative that remains a central point throughout the film. Marsha saw the wall and she said, Carl, you know damn well he has never had this many black people on his wall in his entire life. Marsha, what are you talking about? How dare you accuse us of such things? I was miserable. I was angry. That is very dirty pool. If we had had a Latin jury, we would have had a picture of him in a sombrero. I had the great pleasure of watching this documentary with my wife, who knew nothing about the O.J. Simpson trial, nor anything that preceded or followed it. The result is that I got to relive the reaction of the people at the time. She was enthralled in the story and shocked at the twists that were permeated throughout. But it reminded me that the story of OJ is exactly that. It was a form of mass hysteria that one man encapsulated. The story is in one part the rise of a charismatic young boy into the biggest star in sports until it becomes a profiling of the psychology of one of the most enigmatic and perplexing celebrities of the modern era. Then it's a courtroom drama laced with all the intrigue and revelations as any of the great true crime documentaries. Next, it becomes a mapping of the multi-layered puzzle that is the United States, a nation that more than ever displayed its mainstream schizophrenia during the OJ trial. And finally, it ends in one of the most perplexing anticlimaxes to a story that confuses and sullies everybody's narrative. The story of Orenthal James Simpson is fascinating on its own, but Made in America took a story that the majority of people already know and threaded every possible perspective into a singular epic portrait. If you know the story, this documentary is still vital viewing because it delves into layers of documenting an individual which is so vast and simultaneously nuanced that what you're left with is a masterclass of storytelling. That's what this documentary is, a profile of a brief moment in history wherein a single man became the warped visage for an entire nation. Everything that was America was O.J. Simpson. They had a real love affair, these two. When they were together, it was just, it was love. And that's what makes this thing so sad.
Number four, close up and close up long shot. The question of what constitutes a documentary would seem to have a rather binary answer. Either something is or isn't a document of reality. But what about a hybrid between the two? Thus we come to Abbas Kiarostami's Close Up, a part fiction and part real event retelling of a sensational story of an Iranian man and his love for film. <laughs> A simple worker who one day when riding a bus gets into a conversation with a woman about cinema. As the conversation flows, the man inexplicably tells her that he's Iranian director Moshin Makmelbath, which he is not. He forms a friendship with the family who all believe that he's the director, welcoming him into their home. The story itself is an interesting public interest story. However, the documentary about the story does something entirely unique. It reenacts the events with the real people involved. From the moment that Sabzian meets with the family, up until his discovery, are all acted out exactly as they occurred by the same people playing themselves. We do, however, see the trial that occurred after, which is shot by Kiarostami and is a real piece of footage. The film has garnered the reputation of a poetic piece, not just because of Kiarostami's lyricism of images, but because the subject itself is a poetic soul. Sabzian is not attempting to dupe the family out of anything. There's a genuine majesty in the way he views cinema. Perhaps he's a man that descended too deeply into his escapism, but the documentary then also brings into light the roles we play and the perceptions we have of one another. Many of us are playing roles in our lives to the point that we have to play ourselves for people to understand us. Close Up reaches a level of beauty through simplicity that's difficult to capture. It's the purest essence that fiction can't match the intangible nature of the human experience. This is the point in which our fiction and our art collide, and it radiates an eternal quality that few pieces of film have yet to match. However, there is another film that I mentioned, a companion piece to Close Up entitled Close Up Long Shot, that far fewer people are familiar with. Made a few years after Close Up, it's more expectant of how we would imagine a traditional documentary, without the reenactment element, and it follows the life of Sabzian after his role in Close Up. Many documentaries have companion pieces. However, because of the nature of what Close Up aimed to achieve, this piece in particular is a hauntingly impactful one. Close Up aimed to bring to reality the dreams of Sabzian, that perhaps he was deserving enough a subject to elevate film to a plane that few can, which he did, but through a collection of interviews with people who knew Sabzian, as well as Sabzian himself, it's an almost different person entirely from the one we left in Close Up. We find an impoverished man, who since the release of the film had suffered a destroyed reputation, whose dreams have never been realized. The suggestion is that what if Kiarostami, who has wealth and influence, took the poetry that Sabzian had to offer for himself, 
for it was his project, not Sabzian's, that he used his beautifying soul for his art without true consideration that this is Sabzian's reality. Sabzian states how when he was watching Kiarostami direct the scenes of close-up, the family respected Kiarostami just as they'd respected him believing he was Makmalbaf. It was only status that separated them. Kiarostami apparently struggled to sleep after watching close-up long shot, and it's not difficult to see why. It too has shaped my vision of close-up in a way I'm not entirely sure how to evoke. And as for Hussein Sabsian, he was a man who loved cinema more than most people could. He respected and admired the form beyond what it perhaps deserved. His dreams were never realized, however, whether he knew it or not, he became cemented within the history of the medium he so adored. <laughs> Number 3. The Act of Killing Joshua Oppenheimer spent five years in Indonesia, creating a documentary about the Indonesian mass killings of the 1960s. But unlike an expose revealing the crimes against the victims, the documentary takes place from the perspective of the perpetrators, many of whom are still around at the time of filming. The military coup of Indonesia, which sets the groundwork for the documentary, was notably successful due to its recruitment of gangsters and street thugs to enact a mass politicide. Around one million people were killed, and in the act of killing, Oppenheimer allowed the modern day paramilitary leaders to reenact the events of the past in any way they chose. The result is a surreal dive into a murderer's reasoning in an attempt to justify his horrors. What's most striking about the act of killing is the proximity we share with people who are so openly proud of the atrocities they've committed. People who, though boisterous, come across as the kind of extroverted people anyone may come across in their daily lives. And yet the cockiness of how they discuss their crimes gradually shifts over time the more they expose themselves to the truth of the matter. Cuma ini, kalau saya melihat ya, kalau sukses kita bikin ini film, menyatakan bahwa film G30 SPK yang lulu, PKI kejam, tidak kejam. Yang kejam tuh kita. Kita yang kejam. <laughs> kalau sukses, ini film. Makanya aku, aku... Ini yang perlu disadari, sebab kita segala langkah kita harus kita sadar. As the film progresses, it feels as though they need to cleanse themselves and tell what happened. The only thing is, is they can't directly show what happened. It has to emerge through layers and layers of symbols and storytelling that they may disassociate themselves from reality. The perpetrators display moments where they reevaluate their pasts, exposing the double thing that they've been living all their lives, that they were in fact the villains. This is only emphasized by the journey of Anwar Congo, the simultaneous protagonist and antagonist of the documentary. Just one of the heads of the killing groups from decades past, Anwar has no issue in telling the tale so casually of how he used to murder innocent people on a daily basis. Yet Oppenheimer's ingenious method of storytelling intercuts the documentary with sequences showing Anwar what's been filmed thus far. Apakah orang yang kusiksa dulu itu rasanya seperti aku begini? Ah, itulah dia. The documentary attempts to expose for the uninitiated 
the degree of trauma and complete loss of humanity at this point in history, and manages to go further by transposing and capturing some remnants of humanity that still exist in these criminals. As the documentary continues, Oppenheimer, by reframing the actions, initiates feelings of regret, of deep sadness, from those who have destroyed so much. The act of killing doesn't show any archive footage, nor does Oppenheimer make himself a present figure, and yet the content within the film is so ruthlessly violent and uncaring for human life, it cuts deeper than any action could. Beginilah caranya supaya jangan darah itu terlalu banyak, tahu kan? The film captures a moment in time equivalent to a nightmare, and its consequences have left its remnants in a dreamlike state between reality and fiction. There's always reasoning behind your actions, whether it be ideological, to gain power. Yet when confronted with the fallout of one's decision, the act of killing shows that the human condition remains even in the most awful of us. And once more, it's the power of the image that's on display. Because for their entire lives, these men managed to live unaffected by their atrocities. It was only when confronted with the abstraction of their histories that something re-emerges from their past, something that seemed lost. Oppenheimer shows that everything ultimately is a story, but it's how we tell that story that dictates our past, present, and future. Pergi nonton berduaan Aduh emas sakitnya Nonton dua-duaan Kayak nona dan tuan Di gedongan Number 2. Shoah The word documentary stems from the idea that we are to document something. This means that we are to archive it, to preserve it. Many of the great documentaries deal with human interest stories, and their method is to find some, hopefully, new way to tell those stories that emerge in life, whose structure naturally seems to fall into place. But how do you tell a story about history? A history that shaped the world as we know it today, and one that's still present in the lives of those who experienced it. What could you tell a friend of mine? He worked as a barber. He was also a good barber in my hometown. When his wife and his sister came into the guest chamber, Shoah is likely to remain the most important documentary because it seems to transcend beyond documentary into a human capsule. It has but one focus, and that is the first-hand testimony of the people who were present during the Holocaust. Claude Landsman spent 11 years making the film, collecting hundreds of hours of testimony from the cavalcade of humanity that the Holocaust touched. Whether this be ex-prisoners of the concentration camps, train drivers that transported prisoners, the local inhabitants of the town of Auschwitz, and neighbours to the other death camps scattered through the scenic landscape of Central Europe. At over nine hours in length, Showa never presents itself as anything other than what it is, a record of what happened, but well, not from any expository sense, exclusively from the voices of people. <laughs> Nous, euh, nous avons pleuré tout comme eux, dit madame. Oui, merci. 
Là, il là, puis au bourg qui nous chuent. Et M. Kantorowski leur donnait de la nourriture, du pain et des concombres. It does not seek to overindulge, play upon our emotions, or even offer a perspective of the filmmaker. It's less of a documentary and more so the everlasting burden on the shoulder of humanity, of what it did in a single moment of history. The structure of the documentary may seem daunting at first glance, to know that for the nine hours there's not a single piece of archival footage from the Holocaust itself. In an almost adverse perspective to the killing of America, Shoah ensures that nothing beyond the human story is shown within this film. Cependant, on a pu observer qu'au moment de la fermeture des portes, le chargement se presse toujours fortement vers celle-ci, vers les portes, dès que l'obscurité survient. The testimonies that we see are unedited, even the translation between languages so that nothing comes between our vision and the reality that the person telling the story now lives. Many of the testimonies included in Shoah have helped verify certain facts about the Holocaust that were once deemed a speculation. But the film never fails to remind us that these are real stories from real lives. In one sequence which describes the journey through a concentration camp, we walk from a point of view through the remnants of that very walk described. Showa is a towering piece of filmmaking that almost breaks beyond the very confinements of what filmmaking is. It doesn't possess the poetic symbolism of the act of killing, nor the transgression of the medium that close-up has. Instead, it strips away all excess. All we're left with are human beings telling their stories, exposing the harsh and grim reality of the capacity for human evil. And yet with our lens acutely attached to their experience of life now, rather than turning toward the evil that preceded them, perhaps we're reminded that it's life and the human experience that will outlive all evil and will continue to blossom, as trying as the times that follow may be. Man soll die Hoffnung nicht aufgeben, bis man lebt. Und so haben wir gekämpft in unserem harten Leben, von Tag zu Tag, von Woche zu Woche, von Monat zu Monat, von Jahr zu Jahr. Mit der Hoffnung, dass es vielleicht doch uns gelingen würde, von dieser Helle, also dieser Helle entrinnen zu können. Number one, American movie. One of the cornerstones of the documentary genre is how life is more often than not far more interesting than any form of fiction the human mind can conjure. But in American movie, life is in fact an incredibly simple and quaint thing, but it's the people that inhabit it that are brimming with such eccentricities and individuality that watching them on their self-imposed journeys is enough of a story itself. To be totally honest with you, man, it was a really, really profound moment. So I was thinking, I'm 30 years old, and in about 10 seconds, I gotta start cleaning up somebody's shit, man. Sometimes stories behind works of art are as interesting as the art piece itself, many of which have been chronicled. Hearts of Darkness chronicles the making of Apocalypse Now. Jodorowsky's Dune tells the retroactive story of an artist's magnum opus that never was. American Movie, on the other hand, is about the creation of a work of art that probably none of you have ever seen. It's about Wisconsin native Mark Bordchart and the creation of his lifelong passion project, his film, Northwestern. Where are those other, where is this part of the film? What are you gonna have, a blank spot on the film? What are you gonna do? You gotta find each missing piece and tape this in. That's what I mean. You go to a movie, you see this. You don't pay to see that. What the fuck is supposed to occur here? The documentary carries an immense charm in that what we watch is a man who doesn't care about fame or money and puts everything he has into creating a sincere work of art that he wants to make. You ever see Manhattan? You ever see uh, The Seventh Seal where they have these great dialogues with these great backgrounds? You know, talking about the plague and there's a gargoyle in the back, or talking about life and there's Jupiter or Saturn in the back. 
I mean, this just looks right. I mean, this is perfect. I mean, the way I see it. For anyone in any creative field, it's people like this who are the ones that should be looked up to. That despite every setback, that despite all of life's adversities, they continue to push through, delivering time and time again quaint little gems of life advice. You know, you can't start stop and justify your inaction of script writing by making a pizza or something. Man, you got to be in this car. You have no other choice. Why the hell are we here? We're working on Northwestern, the third draft. I've got to get it so it's not embarrassing to give out. You know what I mean? There's some corny dialogue that make the Pope weep, and I've got to resurrect that, uh, so to speak. Mark is only one half of the movie, though, as he's accompanied by his best friend and perhaps the purest person to ever feature in a film, Mike Shank. A loyal dog in human form, Mike is the friend we wished we all had, unquestionably assisting Mark in all of his endeavours, never shifting his quiet yet sunny disposition. Would you buy this movie for fourteen ninety five? Yeah, hell yeah, man. You know, I if I can it. find three thousand people like you across this country, man, I'm in business. <laughs> of course, yeah. You should have what rush tickets for. <laughs> the pairing of these two is one of the greatest things you'll see in cinema, and it's amazing that two people that most have never heard of, who by most people's parameters of success didn't do much are part of one of the most inspirational stories I've ever come across. The passion Mark has for his work and the integrity of both to be as themselves at all times, as characteristically different as they are. Here's what I think of the lottery. I think it's like when you play the lottery, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but it's better than using drugs or alcohol because when you use drugs or alcohol, especially drugs, you always lose. With American Movie, there's a question of whether through pure passion alone, can a person make it within this grand cinematic landscape? We're not quite sure, but what we do know is that regardless of the outcome, the story that they're left with is an incredibly human one. One that resonates far more than the results of a giant production with not a fraction of heart as this. Stories of credit card debt dialing up, having to use your parents and family members in your project as a last resort, staying up until all hours to complete something that no matter what anyone else thinks, you know to be worthwhile. These are the things that American Movie shows us, diluting the mystique of the art process and issuing a realization that all creation is just one of life's many branches. And there are far more important things within that to hold on to. Integrity, friendship, family. If ever in your creations there's doubt, or you ever feel like you've lost your way, if there was ever a film to watch to realign yourself, it is American Movie. Ready, Mike? When I say take one, give it a couple seconds. Take one. That was wicked, man.